Great. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Robert Gonzalez. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Jeff Harner Lecture and Awards Ceremony. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. I wanna begin with a big thank you to the Thornburg Foundation. for making this award program happen. I would like to thank Garrett Thornburg, chairman of the board of the Thornburg Foundation. Mr. Thornburg personally leads the company's philanthropic efforts. Oh, is sound okay? I think, um, can we mute everyone please? Aaron, thank you. Thank you also to Leslie Garcia, Administrative Director and Community Funding Officer of the Thornburg Foundation for helping us get through this year's awards program. And thank you to Alan Oliver, Executive Director of the Thornburg Foundation for guiding me through my first year of the award program. I would now like to invite Alan to join us in kicking off this year's awards program. Terrific. Th Thank you, Dean Gonzalez, um, and welcome students, faculty, and guests to this first ever virtual Harner Lecture and Award event. Um, for the Thornburg Foundation, this may be the first time our international board members are able to see the event live, and uh, for us, a rare upside to the current pandemic. Um, our founder, Garrett Thornburg, created the foundation to support nonprofits serving children, the homeless, and the hungry, and, and to advance smart policy for a more sustainable agricultural system, early childhood education, as well as to advance um, uh, democratic government. This year, we're, we're uh, adding in two more critical areas. Uh, we're advancing, working to advance sustainable water policy and improving K-12 education. Um, I'm also, I just also wanted to lift um, that our board has worked very hard and very quickly, as well as our team, to make more than $1.25 million worth of grants for COVID relief over this last year, as well as 200,000 in grants to support racial justice work in New Mexico. Um, Garrett is also a passionate supporter of contemporary architecture, which brings us uh, here today. 14 years ago, he created the Jeff Harner Award for Contemporary Architecture to honor his friend who had passed away at the age of 46. But despite his relatively young age, uh, Jeff Harner left a legacy of an innovative and sustainable designs for uh, dozens of projects throughout northern New Mexico. I'd like to thank Dean Gonzalez for the new direction he's taken the Harner Award. We're excited about the Harner Awards geographic expansion, the new award categories, uh, and the commitment to support equity and diversity and inclusion within the field of architecture. It's our deepest hope that the Har Harner Lecture and Awards continues to inspire young architects to take creative risks, to take on the challenge of sustainability and inclusion, and to push the limits of our collective imagination. Thanks for all those who offered their ideas, their vision, their guidance, because within this democracy of ideas, we believe that the field of contemporary architecture will continue to renew and thrive. And so with that, with great gratitude to the UNM School of Architecture um, and Design, we pass it back to you, Dean Gonzalez. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so before I introduce our Jeff Harner lectures tonight, I also want to thank Elizabeth Castillo, our Administrative Coordinator, for helping us with the Jeff Harner program this year, and Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture, Anthony Fetzes, for helping us direct the award program as well. <laughs> So it is a great honor to introduce the international firm Snohetta, 
especially two key members of the firm who have inspired so many with their story. I was fortunate to study with Craig Dykers and Elaine Molinar at the University of Texas at Austin and was so happy to see their meteoric rise shortly after Elaine and I finished our studies. I remember the year 1980, 1989, when many of us were returning from Europe where we were working and living and discovering that our colleagues, Elaine and Craig, who were living in Los Angeles at the time, had just won an international competition. Elaine and Craig collaborated with Norwegian friends via fax and submitted the winning design for the Alexandria Library in Egypt, beating all, beating all of the major architecture firms in the world at the time. And the rest is history. Snohetta has won some of the discipline's most notable awards. Their award projects include the Oslo Opera House, the National uh, September 11 Memorial Pavilion, and the addition to SF MoMA. The firm Snohetta began as a collaborative architectural and landscape workshop, and the firm was re has remained true to its transdisciplinary work of thinking. The firm's main offices are located in Oslo, Norway, and New York City, and they have studios in San Francisco, Innsbruck, Paris, Hong Kong, Adelaide, and Stockholm. Please join me in welcoming Craig Dykers and Elaine Molinar. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, just <laughs> testing our audio. It seems to work. Can the seance begin? Are we here? <laughs> yeah, <It's, laughs> I right. suddenly feel my heart pounding in my in my headset. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, we can start sharing a screen. And I, uh, yeah, I tried that. If that's uh, mm -hmm. not enabled yet. All right. Uh, while All right. The, while we're working on that, I'll um, make a short introduction, uh, and then Elaine will uh, present, some, and I will pr both present projects. Um, uh, we're a somewhat unusual company. We're not named after a person. We're named after a place. Uh, this mountain, Snöhetta, which is in uh, central Norway, and it's where the um, mythic uh, palace of Valhalla is located inside of this mountain. It's a beautiful place, and it represents the spirit of landscape and architecture coming together that we um, feel we, we enjoy exploring. And uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about our work uh, in a specific part of the world, even though we are working all over the world. Our hearts are near and dear to the territories west of the Mississippi. Uh, Elaine and I both have heritage in New Mexico and West Texas. My father's family are all from, from, uh, from New Mexico. I've been going there all my life. And in fact, my father's buried in Santa Fe. And um, Elaine's family are from El Paso in the area of the three states region of New Mexico, Texas, and Chihuahua. So yes, uh, we're, uh, we were... Uh looking at all of the work sort of connected to the theme uh, of the Southwest or the Four Corners. We, we're looking at all of our work west of the Mississippi and oddly enough, we have no work in the Four Corner region. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unusual. It's a place we're both so connected to, but we haven't yet worked in, yeah. in that specific area. But for, for whatever reason, ge geography we thought could be an interesting way of looking at this part of the world and and seeing if there are any characteristics uh, that might tie them together, uh, areas that you're familiar with. When we say west of the Mississippi, of course, that means the rest of the world because everything is west of the Mississippi, but we're primarily talking about North America. On the other hand, we recently finished a project in Japan and, it, and we just thought, well, we'll toss that in because it's also west of the Mississippi. This is so, one of uh, the advantages of living on a sphere. Yeah, so we'll briefly um, touch on that project also. So this uh, is the areas that we'll be focusing on. Um, of course, landscape, climate, and culture are three very key attributes of these regions uh, where most of you live uh, in, in the Southwest and in the Western states. Um, the climate is quite unique. The cultures are very special. And of course, the landscape is often awe-inspiring. And uh, this has been, a, a, the, all of these have been contributing factors to our work. And uh, Elaine is going to take us through our first project in uh, Guadalajara in Mexico. Yeah, just down the road. Uh, we started this project about a decade ago. Uh, things move uh, on their, in their own time. Uh, and this has, uh, has been one of those projects. Guadalajara, I mean, we were talking about some powerful landscapes last night 
And the city of Guadalajara is set in an incredibly dramatic landscape of, of canyons and mountains. And the, uh, we're designing a Museum of Environmental Sciences, which celebrates and examines the, um, the, the various microclimates and, and flora and fauna of this part of Western Mexico, the state of Jalisco. The Spanish name is wonderful, Ciencias Ambientales. Yeah, which is just a great, nicer. yeah, much nicer. <laughs> of course, not only were we inspired by the landscape um, in this region, but also its history of Spanish colonial architecture and the way it uses uh, massive walls, arcades and courtyards to deal with the climate that, that it is in. So we, um, we took that idea of the courtyard and the experience of that courtyard and tried to sort of imagine it as also a canyon-like experience. And they have a courtyard um, canyon-like uh, space in the middle of this museum, which is in quite a dense city. It's, it sits within a campus location. It's part of a larger master plan. Uh, it sits between a large auditorium and the library. And so this uh, kind of a wadi or, or trail of landscape that- Arroyo, that I think would be the right building. word. Uh, it, <laughs> Also, you have to pass through the building to cross the campus and you, you end up in the center in that protective courtyard, uh, which kind of takes your mind out of the uh, urban quality of the city. So here is um, the entrance to that space. It's clad in uh, natural volcanic stone. It's a concrete structure, it's that central courtyard. It's been under construction for several years now, it has a few, few more years to go. There's going to be a, a water feature in the, in the center of this courtyard. And it has uh, an accessible roof with um, uh, gardens on the roof as well with uh, comp uh, comprised of indigenous planting. And it gets a another way of getting you up above the city and to get your mind into the landscape in the distance of, of the region. Um, there we can see the construction coming along. Um, this is looking back towards the city as opposed to out into the landscape. These photos are just quite new. And then from that center space, it also frames the sky. That's another, uh, another project that deals with a valley, although a different kind of valley, is uh, a project that we're working with to provide uh, uh, river access to the Willamette River at the Willamette Falls nearby Portland, Oregon and Oregon City. Um, these are the second largest waterfalls by volume uh, beyond uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, in North America. So they're quite significant, although over the years, the waterfall has been industrialized and lost much of its power. Much of its water is diverted to a hydroelectric plant. And these are old um, paper and wool mills that were built alongside the water, uh, water's edge. Those mills have been abandoned. And so now it's a kind of a wasteland, a sort of Chernobyl looking place, which is rather spectacular and awe-inspiring in its own way. Um, but there's no way for people to get to the water. Furthermore, cultures have associated with this beautiful waterfall for centuries. And in fact, for millennia, the indigenous um, uh, people, the uh, First Nations uh, tribes, that live in the region respect the waterfall in a specific way and they require and need more access to the waterfall. There's a cultural heritage by the, um, those who colonize the region and uh, also of course uh, uh, leisure activities that occur around this waterfall. And so our job is to make it accessible to people. But our first goal, as we told everyone when we started the project is that um, people are not the only clients, animals and plants are also clients in a place like this. And we created a calendar that you can see here on the left of the life cycle of all the different uh, indigenous plants and, uh, and animals, birds and fish and other forms of wildlife in, alongside the river here. And we're cycling uh, human activity alongside these uh, animal and plant activities and trying to make it symbiotic so that the two won't interfere with one another. Um, the place is really essentially a huge concrete platform built up over the existing natural edge of the Willamette River here, where there were once waterfalls. And we discovered that all we have to do is sort of peel up the concrete and expose uh, the natural terrain underneath. I think that's on the next slide. Nothing, yeah, there it is. Uh, so um, uh, because these uh, uh, platforms of concrete were built on piles, 
and on columns, the natural terrain still existed on, exists underneath them. So we re-expose it, allow the water to uh, flow more naturally alongside these tributaries and create an interactive walkway that moves through some of the facilities that we uh, have seen to, to be interesting and important in the history and that are not uh, dangerous to people. We've had to remove most of the dangerous and polluted uh, portions of the site in order to make this happen. So we're simplifying the site. Next slide. So here you can see a, a kind of clarifying tank on the left. This is where water would be uh, uh, sort of funneled in and silt would settle and clear water would be taken out for use in the uh, manufacturing equipment nearby. And that's now empty and no longer used. And so our proposal is to fill it with earth uh, the next slide and create a new park inside the old clarifying tank. And then the old buildings off to the right, we remove all of the facades. We're creating interesting uh, interactive atmospheres inside of these. So one of them on the, uh, the building in the distance, you can see there's a forest that's been planted inside the building and then a, a kind of play area for children and so forth to get up and high and see the, the waterfalls from a, a, new, um, a new perspective. <clears throat> Next. Um, another project that we're working with uh, in the West uh, that we just uh, received a commission for, it's a rather unusual project to create a presidential library, library for a deceased president, Theodore Roosevelt. So this will be the first presidential library for a deceased president. And it's going to be in an unusual place in the badlands of North Dakota. Um, many of you might ask why, and that's because Theodore Roosevelt, in a sense, built his personality uh, in uh, the west of the United States, in this area around the Badlands in North Dakota. Uh, when he was a young uh, man, he was quite sickly. Uh, he had uh, difficulty breathing and wasn't very strong, actually. He wasn't considered a strong person. And he married, and, and at an early age in his life, both his wife and his mother died uh, at, within the same week. So he lost his wife and his mother, and he decided he needed to leave New York City, where he was a kind of dandy, went out west and started reading a lot of books and uh, sort of understood the world and nature better. And for those of you that live in these beautiful places, like many of you do in New Mexico, uh, you'll know that the landscape has a power powerful effect on your psyche. And for Theodore Roosevelt, it certainly had that. He became the Teddy Roosevelt that we know here in these places. And this is the site uh, um, overlooking the Badlands National Park, which was among the first national parks in the world, and uh, where the idea of conser conservation was born through uh, Roosevelt's connection to this wonderful place. There are actually prickly pear cactus up here. Next slide. Uh, you'd be quite surprised at how similar it is to the, uh, to the desert southwest, even though it's quite far north. Um, I don't know, there might be a lag on the slide, but it's not I think changing. There is. This is looking at Pete's Ponderosa. Uh, here we go. That's yeah, now it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> okay. um, so we spent a great deal of time evaluating the natural conditions. You know, we're 30% landscape architects in our studio. And so we always learn about uh, naturalized and native plants and how they can affect the design. We spend a lot of time going out into the little towns and talking to people. And this is a funny little place I stumbled across in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. It looks like a cafe, but you can see there's no doors or windows or roof. It's just an empty uh, shell of a building with an old pickup out front. Couldn't find anybody around this place to talk to, but it was quite special. Uh, we did talk to train uh, engineers though and others in some of these small places. Uh, this is an actual view of the site where the presidential library will be. And actually the site that they expected uh, people to build on is straight ahead at the end of this road on top of that hill. But when we approached the site, we saw how beautiful that hill was and we thought putting a building there is just downright mean, no matter how beautiful a building it is. So we chose a site to off to the right here and protected all of the landscape as much as possible so that the landscape has as much power as the building. And if you go to the next slide, and that, that uh, the reason for that is, is uh, very important. Uh, these landscapes have been grazed over the years, so they're partly naturalized and partly native. Uh, they're, they're threatened and fragile landscapes. The Badlands is a fragile uh, ecosystem. And so by leaving as much intact as possible will allow biodiversity to thrive and uh, allow for natural conditions such as drainage and erosion to occur without the influence of a structure. Uh, these are my little sketches I made when I was out there of some of the 
those spots. It's really quite beautiful. Next, uh, and uh, of course, there is this rather unusual silhouette that the Badlands mesas give. And of course, being in New Mexico, I don't have to tell you about that. Uh, there's something rather wonderful about a butte rising in the distance or softer hill in the foreground with a, a mesa beyond. Um, and uh, so that began to inspire us. Uh, next slide. Uh, we wanted the building silhouette to merge with these feelings, but furthermore, we wanted it to come from its place. And on one of the walks we took, I found these couple of pebbles, which were very unusual because they were smooth. And in this part of the, the West, uh, it's rare to find smooth rocks like this. They're usually much more rough. And a little leaf that I picked up and sort of put the two together. And went, while we were talking about the shape of these soft hills, next slide, uh, we realized that um, putting them together kind of created this interesting composition. Uh, the program naturally fit into two separate uh, structures, but the roof over the top allowed it to be uniform and, and held together in a, in a covered space where people could walk and go out and see the, um, the, the silhouette of the, of the mesas in the distance. Uh, next slide. Like a dog uh, trot. Yeah, very much like that. Uh, we situated the, the building, of course, uh, in relation to how we could minimize the impact of wind on humans that are moving through there because we as humans are, I think, essentially weak compared to many other animals when it comes to climate. We may need to be protected much more. So the building helps protect you from sometimes rather strong winds that come down from Canada into this part of North Dakota. Uh, next slide. Um, and here's the building and seen in its site plan pushed uh, a little close to the edge here. So we've since moved it back from the edge. Uh, it's a dangerous spot to be in the Badlands because of erosion, um, but essentially in the same location uh, with a, a connection up over the roof. So you can climb up on the roof or take a walkway outside and have a picnic. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, here you can see uh, what the building might appear as in the distance. It's a very understated building somewhat soft-spoken. And we think that uh, Roosevelt inspired us in this way. He was a, he, he was a strong uh, conservationist and, and a strong connection to nature, but he was also very simple. When he moved to North Dakota, he built himself a tiny little one room wood cabin and that's where he lived. It didn't even have a toilet. So it, um, it, it kind of told us that we needed to stay simple too. This is the uh, dog trot like space between what is on the left, the library, and on the right, community facilities for the nearby town of Medora uh, here in the snow. And as you go out to the edge there, you can overlook the valley. Next slide. Here's what you'd see if you pass through uh, the dog trot and you come to the very edge of the building. Uh, you're still protected. You can sit on a, uh, a little rocking chair like Roosevelt may have done and look off to the national park in the distance. Next slide. Uh, at night, we're, although this was rendering to be more dramatic for the images in the magazines, we're actually controlling the light. So there'll be less light than this uh, leaking from the building. And the idea is to keep light leakage down to the minimum so that you can really appreciate the stars and, uh, and the heavens by standing on top of the building or being nearby. Next. <clears throat> And as you approach it from the original kind of entry locations, it also sort of slowly reveals itself. And you can see because the roof is accessible, those little black dots on top of the roof are, are people. So you'll see people meandering across the top of the building, which we think can be very exciting and dramatic. Before we leave this project, I'll show you some smaller structures. One of them has to do with parking on the next slide. Um, we do have to do a little bit of excavation and we're going to use the excavation to build these berm walls around the parking areas that help block the wind and also minimize the visual impact of the cars on this beautiful landscape. You can see that in the next slide here. So it'll be a very um, interesting uh, parking space. We're actually uh, making it round rather than square and it'll be a little unusual uh, to park there but actually most of the people that arrive here will arrive by a little electric train and will park down in the valley that's our proposal only the a bare minimum of parking will be allowed near the building there's a walkway uh, you can point to the building on the upper right Elaine you show where the building is with your arrow yeah that's the building up there yeah and the rest of this is the site that we kept 
preserved by not putting our building in the middle of it. And so we're keeping uh, this space clean and free and we'll you do some agricultural research here and have a little liver shaped like walkway that goes between pavilions. So you can go out into the landscape and find nice little places to stop. And each of these pavilions will have a unique relationship to history and landscape. Some of these pavilions will be built in the national park itself. This is a small uh, fireplace space that will be out in the middle of that field. And um, these are some of the walkways that they, they stay level. So the walkway never goes up or down. It cuts through the landscape or floats over the landscape. And so you're always uh, sort of experiencing it through one level. And here's, as you approach it from the valley below, sort of rises up and on the left, you can see that little sort of road. That's actually the roads, uh, the trolley car, the electric trolley, which takes you from the parking below will come up this path over these little trestle bridges and drop you off at the library at the top and you can hike up or ride horses to go there as well. Yes, so, so while the Museum of Guadalajara was very much about protecting you from the elements and bringing nature inside, this one really is all about being outside. The, the museum is outside, the landscape is a, a library in, in a way. And also this, <laughs> this next project uh, over in Houston is very similar in that it, it, um, it celebrates the extreme of climate that Houston has. It has ra extreme rain, extreme winds, heat, hurricanes. Um, so that it, it is also about being outside and also about celebrating travel. You know, we used to celebrate travel um, back when it was new and, uh, and exciting. And in the early 2000s, around 2004, Houston started to uh, add light rail lines downtown, uh, which was great, which is uh, unusual for Houston. And, and um, about 10 years ago, we won a competition for one of the light rail stations downtown. Um, uh, so our, our idea were, was to have these, uh, to create these funnel-like concrete shells, uh, which would capture the rainwater and kind of uh, increase its velocity as it poured down uh, through the columns and down below the street level to the storm sewer collection system. Uh, we had to uh, figure out how this could be built off-site and constructed without interrupting the existing light rail line service. Um, and you could see up here at the top, it's perforated to allow light and it also allows some rain through, but it's extending beyond the platform. So you always remain protected on the platform, but you can kind of uh, enjoy the storm around you. If you're uh, on one of the upper level office floors uh, across the street, you can look down and see this weather-like uh, phenomenon image in that canopy. It almost looks like a tornado or a hurricane tracking along the, the street. Right. Uh, we did have to demonstrate, and, and we did, that the construction methodology uh, and uh, would allow um, uh, an economic uh, construction system without interrupting the light rail line and then it met the budget. And while we actually did all of those things, um, the city of Houston just couldn't go there and they erected this instead. Out, of, out of the box <laughs> uh, platforms instead. So um, I think we're still bitter about this one. It's, it's still <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, down the road, a bit further further west in uh, Austin, UT Austin, our alma mater here, uh, we are uh, designing an addition to the Blanton Museum of Art. So the, the building, the, the museum here is, is in two pieces. It's uh, this building over here and this building over here. And uh, they're fairly indistinguishable. They could easily be mistaken for classroom buildings. It's, it's uh, not clear the museum and the museum has suffered from it, this lack of identity. Uh, what you're seeing here in the, in the middle right now is the recent addition, the recent acquisition of Ellsworth Kelly's Austin Pavilion, um, which is, is starting to create a new identity for the museum. Um, you can see it in plan here. This is the Kelly Pavilion. And this part of the Blanton over here is where the gift shop and cafe and administrative offices are. And then over here on the right is the museum with the galleries itself. The, the problem is though, 
nobody knows that unless you're familiar with this institution and have been there several times, you don't know where the door is. So people really just can't even find the door. It's also on the edge of campus along Martin Luther King Boulevard here. Um, and this is Congress Avenue. So it has a, that, an axial view straight down to the Texas Capitol. Uh, I, Craig, I almost said US Capitol. Yeah, I know. I always say US Capitol yeah. accidentally. <laughs> Um, so what we've pr proposed to do was in addition to marking the entrances on the buildings themselves is to uh, have these uh, shade structures. Um, there's 40 plus feet high shade structures because um, it's, it's again, climate extremes in, in Austin. Uh, shade structures not only to create a more habitable microclimate uh, for people in the courtyard, but also to create to move the identity of the museum beyond its doors so that when once you've come to this part of the campus you feel like you're already in the museum and having a cultural experience the museum has to not only uh, address its neighbors on campus but it is also a civic institution so it, it kind of has a double a dual identity um, the design of the petals themselves you'll see is, is a bit of an earlier sketch um, over here on the right, but what they do is when they're side by side, they create an implied arch, uh, which serve as both a, a portal to both the, the Ellsworth Kelly and, and the, the Texas Capitol um, and the opposite, and also echo the arched colonnades of the existing buildings. So they, not only do they frame those views of key icons in Austin, but they create that experiential gateway of leaving the street, leaving the campus and coming to the museum. Um, they're perforated, they're made out of a composite material so that they don't uh, get hot, they're, so they're not hot to the touch. And um, they, do, they do collect rainwater, uh, though not, they're not 100% uh, impermeable to rain. Shade is extremely important here uh, in, uh, in, this part of the, in this part of the world and certainly in this part of the campus to be able to make that courtyard habitable and to work for the museum. So those shadows were plotted out Oh, look, it's animated. I didn't realize. <laughs> um, uh, th those shadows are plotted out all across the seasons, uh, uh, which also I, I think create beautiful uh, and interesting patterns, not only on the ground, but also on the, on the facade of the building. Uh, and there, uh, there's uh, the view from the courtyard looking down Congress Avenue to the Texas State Capitol. Ooh. So this is the, uh, the Calgary Public Library, which was completed a little over two years ago. It's located in the foothills and high plains uh, of, of Canada, about 50 miles east of the Canadian Rockies. So it has these huge expansive views, um, which many of us are used to in New Mexico, the Four Corners region, West Texas. And our charge was to create a public library. You'll see the another light rail, um, uh, just barreling right through uh, the building. This was the site, it's sort of long and narrow, which is a little bit less than ideal for a typical public library program. And it also has the light rail line arcing through it from one end to the other, making it even narrower and more challenging. Uh, <clears throat> that, that light rail goes from surface to below grade into a tunnel. Uh, our design problem was also not only to uh, figure out how to design on this a complex site, but to do it without interrupting that light rail line service again. Um, the uh, another, Additionally, another challenge with the site location is that it, it kind of interrupts, it bifurcates two very important neighborhoods in Calgary to the left is downtown, which is highly pedestrianized. This building here is the city hall. And over here on the right is, an, is a new up and coming emerging neighborhood called the East Village. Uh, and those uh, pedestrian walkways are just kind of cut off today by the, or were by the light rail line. And you can see where all those pathways naturally would have wanted to converge had the, the rail line not been there. Um, so our solution was to, um, it was a landscape solution to create a landscape, a topography that uh, rose up over those tracks, uh, kind of created a land bridge and also formed an entry uh, courtyard to the library. 
There are a number of very unusual characteristics to the climate in this region, as is true in much of the areas west of the Mississippi and approaching the Rockies. Uh, this is one phenomenon on the top called a Chinook cloud, which is two areas of, of uh, one of low and high pressure converging in a dry condition uh, with a uh, dew point above. Uh, at a certain level, and it creates these magnificent cloud arches. So this is not a uh, fisheye lens. This is simply what the clouds are doing. They reach from the ground up over your head and back down again. They can be anywhere from five miles to 150 miles across these Chinook arches. They're just a beautiful things. And so we, we began to in, incorporate that thinking in the character of the facade. And we were inspired by the First Nations uh, people's art uh, that is often uh, on display in many parts of, of Alberta that they uh, appreciate showing their works. And so uh, the, some of those forms of simplistic geometries, uh, abstractions were built into our thinking also. So here you can see a kind of very early study model that is somewhat like a Chinook cloud and also almost like a caribou, uh, white caribou dancing or jumping across this new landscape that we've created. And uh, as the building was finally constructed, uh, you can see it here with a long line of people going up the uh, the ramps to get to the door of the library and uh, this somewhat snowflake like facade uh, that feels a bit like the clouds in the distance. Um, many of the people that live there associate the Chinook cloud with it, uh, even though they maybe have never heard the story before. And uh, here's the, the rise up from the East Village side where the residential area is and you go up over the this mound which takes you over the the train uh, path and uh, through and under this beautiful wooden uh, sort of soffit that rises up like a great wave over your head. Um, in a way, it was a quite lucky that we had this ridiculous tr streetcar line going through because it allowed the building to make this beautiful prow and have these unusual um, bridging landscapes that wouldn't have been possible if it was just an ordinary site. This is a detail of some of that wood soffit under construction. It really is something to be under there, this magnificent um, cedar uh, cloud over your head. Uh, next. Um, once you enter the building, there's a sort of swirling atrium space that leads you up to all of the facilities of the library. And as soon as you enter, the atrium allows you to see every single floor of the building and know where everything is without having to ask a question. So it allows you to, um, to orient yourself very quickly. The stairs are intuitive. Uh, the books and uh, other facilities are, are, uh, are located in a simple perimeter pattern around this atrium, which almost feels also like a boat or a kayak in shape. So it has a number of metaphors that can be associated with it. Um, when we opened it, some of the First Nations people were there and had a, had a ceremony for us, a, a pipe ceremony. And one of them said to me, they felt that the building felt it, the building was at, at home in its place. And I thought that was a nice uh, comment uh, to have. Um, along the edges, are, this facade actually uh, incorporates slightly reflective surfaces that help the light dance through the space. This is the children's uh, library uh, down below that you're looking at and a place where the parents can sit and let their kids fool around and they can oversee them from a distance without having to be over them all the time. Yeah, the, the facade, the design of the facade also helps break up the immense length of it and, and also that, that curve. So uh, it's also a, 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 a scale maybe, device. Maybe yeah. Scale makes it feel more intimate. Yeah. Go to the next slide. I think we have some images of uh, on the left. You can see looking down, there's a walkway that runs along the entire perimeter on both sides. So uh, other functions are just set back and it's really like a like you feel you're in a gem you can see the weird light reflections and everything and it's changing all the time all the time so every time you come back there's a new light show uh from and it's a, like many cities in the in the west of the u.s it's actually many days of sunlight um you know like denver mostly sunlight it is very few days where it's cloudy uh next uh, at the point at the ends of the building, we have some anchor spaces, a uh, big adult reading area uh, that overlooks the city. Uh, next, I think we're nearly finished with this. And uh, this is a quiet reading room at the very top of the building uh, that um, is a, a, play, a kind of a, an escape of which the next slide shows um, what you can see there. We're going to quickly move through one or two more projects. 
Um, the first one is uh, the expansion of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, which you can see here, the existing Mario Bota building on the left with the Fluger was the name of the architect who did this Art Deco skyscraper beyond. Our addition is this somewhat white um, flowing shape that is a kind of backdrop to Bota's building, the white color being inspired by the white marble on Bota's skylight. Next. Um, here you can see it as it moves its way along the back side of the Bota building where its actual presence can best be felt. And it, it sort of slides through the urban core, opening up side streets and alleyways that were previously blocked off from visitors that you can see here. So all of those interior streets, right. nobody could access before. Uh, and we've opened them up again with a new expansion. So if you go to the next uh, slide, you can see we pulled the building back from the property line, molded it so that sunlight would come down, yet it would be protected from winds. So once again, climate uh, plays an important role and also providing a sense of security when you can see up towards the sky in these little alleyways. This is view of the building down one of those alleys from where the new tra uh, transportation station is. It kind of rises up. When you're inside, you can see down into some of the galleries that face onto the street. These are free galleries on the street level. You only have to pay to go up in the building. Uh, let's keep going. Um, so you enter from either side of the, from through the original boat to structure or the new Snohetta structure and they all take you to the same place, a centralized art court where you begin your art experience. So everyone shares the same experience. This was the way the stair was in order to make it all work and be safe for fire. We had to remove this rather iconic stair uh, and open it up though we did and you can see right through the building if you look to the next slide. Um, you can see how uh, uh, making that stair lighter gave a visual clue as to what was buried deep beyond the existing building. So you can see you all can the way through. All the way through outside to an outdoor space. Mm -hmm. And there's the green wall that's been planted on that outdoor space that you can see from the original boat to building. Uh, it's an outdoor sculpture court. Many people love to go up to the plants and talk to them. So it's interesting to see how intimate people get with a planted wall, the stairs are, we've, we the old building used 80% of the people use the elevator and only 20% use the, the stairs. Now it's reversed. Um, now most people use the stairs and the new stairs are so exciting and so dynamic. They make you feel you're walking up the hills of San Francisco and uh, people enjoy the quality of light in them. Let's keep going. Uh, the galleries, uh, that appears to be natural light but it's actually carefully designed artificial light to give you the sense that uh, you're getting comfort from the sun, which is important in a, in a very large museum. Uh, even though we have direct access through windows to real sunlight and balconies, even the galleries feel as though they're connected to that experience. Next, uh, the fog and the cliffs were an important feature in thinking about the exterior of the building. These characterize the Marin County and the, the Bay Area. And of course, the fog is well known. And these are kind of like almost the same. The fog is as thick as a cliff sometimes. And the cliffs are as soft as the fog. So uh, we'll work on both of those in identifying the building in the next slide. You can see here um, the building as if it were a cliff and somewhat like the fog slicing through the city. Actually, when we finished the building, because it's horizontal and has this natural look, birds immediately started nesting here. They don't nest on any other building nearby, but birds just think of it as a natural formation and they feel comfortable. There's seagulls come to this building. Uh, they wouldn't go to the other buildings and even humans come to it from time to time and hang off the edge of this cliff and it's very exciting uh, for many of the visitors to get outside as well as enjoying the art and then uh, i think elaine you'll uh yep. you'll take yep. over here yep back back down in our neck of the woods and also my hometown el paso texas uh we are uh, designing the el paso children's museum and science center which is now under construction so that's uh, very exciting um, Robert, you were there when this was new for us. So you know how exciting and meaningful this is to us. Um, it, it's it's more or less here. Uh, El Paso is is um, on the international border in one of the largest binational communities in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there is a uh, sister children's museum on the Juarez side, which is um, uh, off to the right here, some distance. And uh, I, I think it's just a, uh, much needed in, in this part of the woods. El, El Paso has a really rich architectural legacy of historic architecture. And it, it, it's just such a thrill to be able 
to contribute um, to this. It sits right in the heart of downtown, surrounded by all of the other cultural institutions, a ballpark, a convention center, science museum, library, theaters, art museum, and uh, town square. Uh, and right on the edge of the railroad tracks, which I think is, is a pretty exciting aspect for a children's museum. It, it couldn't have been in a more exciting location, uh, in my opinion. Uh, this is our design. Uh, we were inspired by being on the border and erasing those borders at the same time. The community in El Paso and Juarez is, is very fluid. Uh, it's very um, natural. There isn't a sense of uh, a divide between people, uh, at, at least uh, certainly not socially. There are political issues on all borders and um, that uh, happens here as well. But we took our inspiration from the clouds and how they know no borders. And we wanted this building to float, feel like it's floating like a cloud. So this very simple form is uh, sitting above its glass base with the uh, gardens and terraces. And it's um, fun to design for children because you can have a lot more fun. Children like fun things. They do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one of our, this is one of our um, uh, drawings that we made. We cut a section through the building and put all of the exhibits in, uh, which are designed by our exhibit designer, a uh, company called Gyroscope. And, and we, we were inspired by children's books, all of these, you know, the old Richard Scary stories that we all loved as kids, where you get to see everything happening and in every room in the house. Uh, and I, I think the public really um, uh, found this uh, engaging. Uh, they were very, very relatable uh, and they could imagine themselves in the space. It's very straightforward inside. This is the an open, um, the uh, atrium lobby. The entire ground floor is an unticketed space. So those exhibits and cafe and shop and other amenities will be free and open to the public. Um, here it is at night, you'll see through this a uh, featured dormer window. There's a, a very exciting 60 foot climbing structure, which almost every children's museum has now these days. When I was a kid, there were maybe a handful of children's museums and now they, they number in the hundreds, uh, I think for various reasons. Um, children's time is more structured these days. Uh, they don't often have a chance to have that kind of unprescripted safe place to just, you know, go outside and play and come come back when the sun comes down. That doesn't really happen anymore. But that kind of um, that kind of uh, activity and atmosphere can happen inside the museum. We're going to stop now with uh, this last project and Elaine will conclude for us. Um, we work with a group of people called Ghetto Gastro from the Bronx. Uh, here in New York City. They're an amazing culinary, artistic, uh, curatorial group. Uh, they, they create events and, and make interesting food experiences that they design as well as uh, um, uh, sort of, um, uh, dist uh, I guess, um, host uh, events inside right. some of their spaces, curate. Um, and they're also interested in cross sections, intersections between their community in the Bronx and other cultures around the world. And in this case, they've been connected to a number of chefs uh, in Japan and Tokyo. Uh, so um, this is the furthest west of the Mississippi we have. A little project, a very tiny little restaurant for just about 100, maybe 70 people actually uh, in a small district in Tokyo built for the Olympics that are going on now. Um, so this is one of the chefs here talking with uh, his colleague in Japan. This notion of intersections uh, is important to them. Uh, the, the letter X is important too, because sometimes the Bronx is referred to as BX or the X uh, by those people that live there. Uh, and so um, that also translated to the notion of intersection of cultures between Bronx and uh, the African-American communities that are there and those people in the rest of the world. And interestingly, that uh, had a relationship to the plan of the, of the, of the space, this almost X-like room uh, with a proscenium opening, as you can see here in these early sketches. And it's a very, very tiny, tiny space, as many spaces are in Tokyo. Uh, and so as you look along the central table, it's like a catwalk uh, through a proscenium opening to the, to the kitchen, which is slightly raised like a stage. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that curtain on the side can draw closed. So you can open and close those wooden blinds uh, there that expose more or less of, of the kitchen. And looking out from the kitchen, uh, you're looking at 
um, some uh, mostly a dark, you know, we wanted the power of black to be uh, associated with this um, blackness as an idea. Uh, certainly, um, they're very proud of that in, in this particular group in the Bronx. Um, so uh, it, it began to build itself into the aesthetic uh, here in this uh, restaurant in Tokyo. Next. Um, uh, a, a Japanese artist uh, created a, a piece of glass flowers. They do a lot of botanical cooking, organic, uh, using natural um, ingredients in their cooking there. And so this was a, a very nice piece to integrate into the into the sidewall of some of the booths. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're we can go there. yeah yeah, yeah we're we're, just, yeah, we're finished. <laughs> we just wanted to quickly conclude with some of the, the volunteer work that we do in our, in, in our company. And this is, a, of, of course, a way of opening up the doors to our pro profession to people who have never uh, traditionally had the opportunity to be exposed to them. And, and we work with a, a group called Pencil, um, which is a nonprofit organization that connects the business world to the academic world. And we work with a um, New Heights Middle School uh, which is one of the in one of the marginalized communities in New York City. We bring the uh, sixth graders to our studio every year. We've been doing this for a number of years, and we teach them about what we do, and then we create a project together. Um, we show them how to use our tools. Uh, they get to use them themselves. They get to do design work. Uh, this uh, was in 2019. We created uh, some furniture for their school, uh, some benches, which they got to design together with us and build in our studio. Uh, this is a, a, a mock-up of, of uh, the benches they're designing. They actually uh, present the designs to us. So it's interesting. Yeah. They're the presenters and we're the re re listeners. Yeah, and some of them are, are really nervous and, and really don't like that. And others just really love it and get into it right away. Uh, it's really exciting to see. So, and I think uh, we've seen a couple of kids from the early years of our participation go into engineering and coding. Um, we're still working on getting them into architecture, though. <laughs> it's still a project. Um, but it, that's because it really they're is... smart. They're smart not to go yeah. into architecture. Right, right. <laughs> but but in, as we all know, including the the diversity, increasing the diversity in our profession is incredibly important. And it was really nice to see that as as part of the Harner Awards this year. So, thank you. I think we're done. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I hope Great. we didn't run over time too much. No, you're you're short four minutes. Do you want? <laughs> wow, you could, you could have shown Oslo and uh, Times Square. Great. <laughs> <laughs> They're not west of the Mississippi. They're too far west of the Mississippi. <laughs> they are. So we are. We have time now for a few questions before we get to our seven o'clock um, award uh, part of the program. So op opening it up now uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question or talk about the projects. I know Katya Crawford was was writing madly to me, so excited about this. Maybe Katya, do you have a question for our guests? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I, I tried this thing where I, I'm projecting you on a large screen TV. So I didn't wow. <laughs> wow. I, I hope my no, nose hairs don't look too. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> you look fabulous. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Craig, you came to, I, I don't know when the last time you lectured was, I don't remember what year it was, but it was incredibly, incredibly inspiring. And um, I'm just sad it can't be in, in person this yeah, time. Me too. Um, I'm very sad I'm not there. My family won't forgive me for not going to Albuquerque. Good. Yeah. Yes, but it was a really inspiring lecture. And I suppose um, to come up with a, a question for both of you is the, perhaps you could talk a bit more about the relationship between, you mentioned that 30% of your team are landscape architects, but the relationship between architecture and landscape, because I feel like our, I mean, we're fairly interdisciplinary, but I feel like there's got to be such a much stronger connection. My dogs really agree with me. I love, <laughs> love dogs. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that connection is really important. I, I mean, architecture doesn't exist in a vacuum and neither does the landscape around it. Landscape doesn't exist in a vacuum either. They are entirely interdependent on each other. 
symbiotic and it's and it's not about erasing those those boundaries um you know it can be but it but but that's not what it's about um and that well, you know the there's there's the uh sorry craig i'll give you a second sorry um, just trying to put my thoughts together. We each have our own particular expertise that we don't share, um, which is important to be uh, contribute. But um, in the early phases of design, you know, we're all conceptual thinkers and trying to put each other, put ourselves in each other's shoes and see something from a different perspective. Um, I think I think is really important. You know, both of us have heritage on both sides of the border. Uh, between Mexico and the U.S. in some way, Elaine, more than myself. And, you know, when you're at the border, you always, uh, if, you, if you're there and you live there, you appreciate the connections back and forth across the border. And, and you know, whatever your political belief is, there's, it's important to keep those ties and those connections close uh, in the best way possible. And so, as you might imagine, I'm, I'm all for immigration reform. And I believe that same thing has to be uh, associated with architecture and landscape. We need to break down the uh, controls between the two. There should be immigration reform for architecture and landscape disciplines. You shouldn't, yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't uh, be held in, you know, in, in a in a jail cell because you want to cross over into landscape for a change. It, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's not an easy. It's not easy. Um, no, it's not easy. You know, we, we each have, you know, different skill sets, different timelines for, for work. And, uh, you know, getting all of that to work together is, is a challenge that we value. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to add, thank you. I'm going to add another little quick question on here. Do you ever just say no to projects oh, that yeah, you just we, don't agree with? Like yeah. the, F, the yeah. standpoint, ethic? yeah. All the time. Um, but that's not to say that we're perfect or that we're ethically responsibly perfect. You know, we make mistakes too. But uh, yes, there are definitely times where we evaluate something. We feel the client doesn't have the best interests of his community or her community, their community uh, in mind. Uh, they, they are only interested in, in the bottom line and not uh, um, uh, being generous. Uh, and and we, we like uh, projects to be um, socially connective uh, to help bring communities together. And we've convinced many, many people that that brings value to their dollar or to their, to their investment. You improve your economic conditions by being generous with architecture and with landscape. And if they don't understand that, we, we probably don't know mix well. Thank you so much. Uh, I would have a question. Sure. Uh, Yes, my name's Richard Yates. I'm in Santa Fe. Um, and I, I've had the pleasure of walking on the roof in uh, Oslo on your opera house. Nice. Um, very impressive. Um, but I, I see a theme in your, your projects. Uh, I think it probably flows from the uh, landscape architect side, but um, that you like to use your roofs. Um, <laughs> Part of your space, um, and and I, I'm an architect developer. I, I know how difficult that is, and just the uh, the engineering side. So um, I sort of have two questions. One one what I noticed in Norway is there's a different. Uh, the building codes are obviously different, um, and we've got a lot of restrictions that, that I saw that you had a lot of liberties in that roof design that I don't think you could do in the US. Um, as, and then, so I have a very practical question. Uh, in your designs, uh, have, have you had any roof leaks? <laughs> Actually, no, although no. that uh, building, we did have problems with water under the stone uh, because the waterproofing uh, was, was the design of some of the concrete areas um, wasn't left to cure. So moisture seeped up through the waterproofing and into the stone and discolored some of it. We had that problem, um, but we didn't have any roof leaks. And by the way, Norwegian safety codes are quite strict. And uh, you'd be surprised actually that quite a lot of what we did may seem or appear to be beyond code here, but you could create it to be within code uh, potentially on certain types of projects in certain places, maybe not all of it, but some of it. The interesting thing is that mainly you get away with stuff like that because it's outdoors. 
So if you call it a national park, which it is now, the roof of the opera is a national park. <laughs> so you have a different set of code conditions in a national park. I mean, could you imagine if you walk through a national park and every place you needed a handrail because it was more than 18 inches drop, <laughs> you know, you'd have handrails everywhere and, you know, you just can't make nature into code, code safe. Um, so, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, the other thing is uh, about, the, um, about the money. Uh, again, I would uh, say that this is what gave money to the city. Because that roof was accessible, we've had 20 million people plus climb the roof of the opera. And those people come from all over the world and they spend their money in the stores and they buy opera tickets and they increase the property values of everything around it so that there's more tax money for the city. And when you do that, everyone wins. So um, it actually is a tremendously good investment. And we need as architects to get that into our head that we can drive economies. We should be driving economies positively. We're not just sucking money out of people's pockets and throwing it into the air with red wine and napkins that we sketch on. It, and <laughs> that building also was funded 100% by taxpayer dollars uh, mm. and uh, uh, the audience, the typical audience for the opera at ballet is very small, uh, relatively small. And we needed to create a public amenity yeah. that was accessible for everyone because everyone paid for it. Um, we, and, and to also return access to the waterfront. We have several types of sustainability. We talk about environmental sustainability, cultural sustainability, and economic sustainability. Great, thank you. Uh, Roger, you have your hand up. I think I know you, Roger. You look familiar to me. Welcome, welcome back virtually, Craig. Yeah, you had such I, a good time when you gave your lecture here yeah. for the Harm program. Yeah. Uh, sorry that it has to be virtual and sorry your family can't be yeah. filling up one, one whole role of the auditorium. Yeah, I know, I really missed that. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I was gonna ask you, are you still um, entering a lot of competitions or any competitions or how do you and how do you decide which competitions to enter and which ones obviously your your first one with uh, Alexandria I, I think that was your first one yeah <laughs> resounding success in so many ways uh, that was easy to decide to enter but what do you do now do you look at them economically office wise or workforce wise Elaine you want to answer that <laughs> You're the smart one. This is the smart person. <laughs> I think. Well, first, I would say that that in Europe there are a lot more uh, design competitions, and it's a more typical way of getting new work. Here in the United States, while there are competitions, there are plenty of them. There, they're not as many, and it, we are more often in, in in you know in an RFP process or a direct uh, direct commission. Um, and we do evaluate how much we need to spend, uh, what the jury is like, um, yeah. you know, and some of those competitions are without a design, they're just qualifications. The and, opportunity cost is something that that's a, and we look at as, as well. Yeah, sometimes you don't want to win, as if you win, it'll like sink your office. You have to hire 20 people because you won. And that can be a problem as much as it can be a benefit. And Craig, where are you spending most of your time with all of those offices globally? Now? We're, you know, we're in the United States most of the time. Um, when, when it was possible to travel, we traveled back and forth to Europe from time to time. Um, but uh, we have so much work in, in the Americas that uh, it keeps us um, both very, very occupied. And whenever I can, I go out, go out west. So uh, I'll, be, um, I'll be out in the Western Badlands soon and then California and back to Texas. And then I hope to get back out to New Mexico. My father's buried in Santa Fe, so I want to go visit him. Maybe Richard will give you a job one of these days, right, Mr. Yates? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. That'd be great. <laughs> hmm. Great. We have a comment from um, Patrick McCarthy. Patrick, would you like to say a few words? Well, I, I will only say that I very much appreciate, um, as I said in my comment, your integration of um, native biodiversity and 
sort of the sweep of that particular landscape into the library. So, so thank you for that. And I, I don't have a question other than maybe I missed this, but um, now that you've won that competition, what are the next steps in the, in the design and construction of that library? Well, because you bring up biodiversity, we very quickly found out that there was a, a grouse mating spot there. So um, there's a little place where, where grouse like to have parties and make babies. So <laughs> we have to protect that. Um, we're also looking at back burning. And it's so funny, we had been presenting to the client how we were going to burn away some of the, the grass areas. And uh, um, not only was it dangerous because of its uh, grazing techniques that have been used, but also um, a naturalized or non-indigenous vegetation was moving into this place. And then two weeks later, they had a gigantic fire and it burned right across the site. <laughs> so uh, it was not, uh, not one that we set. So um, we're, we're evaluating what that fire did. So, you know, fire exposes things. So we're looking at what it has been exposed, what, what areas um, died in different ways. And of course, everything grows back almost immediately in the springtime. So it's already turning green again. And what, what turns green uh, is it, we can look at that and look at patterns of growth. So we're doing that. And then of course, we're working with the people of the little town, Medora. Uh, it's a small town of, 120 people and that's on the, the top day of the year. It's normally around 30 people that live there. Uh, and so, you know, finding out what their needs are and making sure that the building doesn't overwhelm their society and their culture. Um, so a lot of things like that. And, you know, trying to make sure that we've got the best design from a zero emissions standpoint, we're gonna make this building zero emissions as well. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. I look forward to seeing it someday. You're welcome. Thanks for all the comments, everyone. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions for our lecturers? So we can move on to the next part of our program. Um, and maybe um, Elaine is the link between the, the Jeff Harner lecture and the jury. Uh, so maybe let's, let's move to the... Uh, uh, award part of the program now. Um, and Elaine, maybe if, if you'd like, if you could give us just a little synopsis of some of, last night we had the jury round table. So in a normal year, the jury would come and visit and they would be here for a few days and they would um, uh, meet and look at the projects and choose a winner. And then they would uh, and, and typically that's happened uh, the night before in Santa Fe, and then they would uh, convene the next day for this event. Uh, so we imagined that we would um, make the jury roundtable a little bit more public, and that's what we did yesterday. Um, and now uh, we are here. So we are, maybe uh, Elaine, if you want to just give us a little synopsis and then we'll move to the next part of the program. And thank you so much uh, for the Snowhead lecture. That was fantastic. Thank you, Elaine and Craig. Pleasure. Uh, well, it was, uh, first of all, really nice to meet the other juries because um, there were separate juries of, of three mm -hmm. jury members each. So we all got to get together um, for the first time and kind of compare notes and um, talk about the trends that we saw emerging in the entries. Uh, I, I think in, in general, what they, many of them had in common was their um, uh, celebration to place and attention to sustainability, which was also very nice to see. And a fondness for the vernacular. We talked about that, uh, I think quite a lot, a kind of a, a respect for the, the great landscape in the New Mexico and Four Corners region. I think that they all shared. Um, there were a few questions. Um, yeah, and, and I think uh, one trend that we wanted to see, or uh, one aspect that we wanted to see more of in the submissions was a, a direct, um, explicit kind of um, uh, relationship to the theme of the awards. Um, so a lot of the, the projects were, were, the submissions were robust and thorough in, the, in, in their own right, but to just have that link to 
you know, um, the theme of, of, the, of the awards this year, I think would have been um, nice to see a little bit more of, but it, it was great, great to talk about the work. There was also some uh, thinking around the four corners and yeah, yeah the, that's right. <laughs> the area that uh, does not know a snow had to building yet. So what, what were some of the think, what was some, some of the thoughts around the four corners? The There's some talk about rebranding of four corners too, which I think we was in, remained inconclusive. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to start this next uh, uh, part of the program. The award, the awards, oops, is it working? There we go. Um, so I'm going to try to be very careful not to um, move ahead too quickly because then I'll give the winners away. But we'll begin with our first um, jury. And let me introduce our jurors, our esteemed jurors, uh, Deborah Burke, who is the Dean of the School of Architecture at Yale University. Renee Davids, who is Professor of Architecture at the College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley. And Frederick Steiner, who is the Dean of the University of Penn, uh, Pennsylvania School of Design. Um, and Deborah and Renee are here. Uh, 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 Fred uh, Fritz is not able to join us today, but we're gonna ask, um, we're gonna, uh, introduce the honorable mentions if there are any first and then the winners and we're asking our um, esteemed jurors to just comment on the projects. So Deborah and Renee, the floor is yours. And um, I'll start with the first one. Any, any thoughts, uh, anything you wanna say, Deborah? First? Well, yeah, no, 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 Robert, uh, thank you so much. I actually wanna say a few things before I even say anything, if that makes any sense. Uh, because I wasn't with you last night and I apologize for that, but I was actually at an event at Yale. I wanted to thank Craig and Elaine for a wonderful talk. And it's interesting to me to meet you in effect in New Mexico, even though we're probably only a few miles apart in New York City right now. Uh, so I thank you, Robert, for this sort of funny remote uh, <laughs> kind of introduction. Uh, Second to say that uh, Renee and Fritz were fabulous to work with and we had such a good time. We're all educators and going through the student work was exhilarating. And, and I would say that even about the projects we didn't necessarily like, we still had a good time uh, talking about the work um, and what's going on in, in school these days. And Finally, I wanna say I didn't know very much about Jeff Harner. Um, so from Alan's remarks at the opening of this evening, I think it makes what we were talking about as we were working on these awards uh, even that much more meaningful. So, okay, now with that <laughs> in my New York sort of staccato, blah, 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 um, I think we <laughs> can um, talk about the awards. <laughs> Great. So we'll we'll start with uh, and I, my understanding is you're going to talk about the architecture awards and then Renee will talk about the landscape architecture. That so is here, We divvied it up. Okay. So here are the first ones. So Fire Station 62 uh, by Nathan McNeely of ASU. Um, you can click through these. Um, I think Robert. Um, we, we enjoyed both the seriousness and the site specificity of this project. It looked like what it was, the right building in the right location, well sited. Um, you can keep going now with the drawings. We thought the, the plan was particularly well figured out and um, addressed the topography um, again, and also uh, spoke to, to the program of this building, which included fire trucks, uh, the, the fire workers, and then also pieces of a community center, which made a lot, a lot of sense given the kind of community service that comes out of buildings like this. Um, then it had an interesting sectional presentation. But if you go to the next slide, I would say what we really appreciated uh, in student work was seeing the thoughtfulness that went into not just what it looked like, not just how the plan worked, and whatever the life experience and how much more there is to learn as you go out and actually become an architect, that there was a lot of thought given to how you would actually make this building. So 
hence our uh, award to Fire Station 62. Great, now the next one, second award. Is, believe it or not, in a very different location and definitely not west of the Mississippi unless really far west, um, is an opera house in Estonia uh, by Trevor Orgel from the University of New Mexico. Congratulations. Um, we found this form, Robert, if you wanna to go to the image, you'll understand what the jury found in this. Um, incredibly dramatic. Um, it has a very compelling interior, which I believe is the next slide. Can't remember quite the order that these were presented in. Yes, where, where there's an interesting use of material and natural light. Um, I will say in all candor, since this is um, a relaxed and almost familial kind of conversation among everybody, uh, that we were sorry to not see how this project was situated within the city at the edge of the city, because you'll see from the next slide that it actually sits out in the water, which of course is um, compelling, but you come to the opera typically from the city. So we, mi we miss seeing that component of it, uh, but we, we were really overwhelmed uh, in a very positive way by the drama uh, of this proposed architecture. So I will now, uh, after congratulating Trevor, uh, hand it over to Renee. Great. So here we have the Landscape Architecture Student Award. Renee. Um, let me echo, first of all, Deborah's uh, comments, both about the lecture today, which I also thought was fabulous uh, and really inspiring, as well as the fact that the, the jury worked really well together and it was extremely enjoyable. Um, I would also like to say that um, it was inspiring to see the lecture because it was very clear, uh, at least with some projects and in general, in the way the, the office is organized that uh, the relationship between architecture and landscape in their office is very intense um, and mutually inspiring. And this, this project actually was entered um, the Memorial for Women and Girls Lost to Climate Change uh, by Isabel Gabash. Uh, congratulations. Uh, was entered as an architectural project, but the jury felt that um, it was a very strong landscape project. Um, so, um, so we gave it the landscape award and you'll see that uh, we were really impressed of um, both about the choice of site, which is um, along the Grand Salt Lake, uh, but it's also uh, an area where, um, maybe that's true for the whole lake, I've never been there, where uh, nothing uh, edible grows, the water is too saline to drink, and there's a process of decertification going on. Uh, and that seemed to us, the jury, uh, like an, a really appropriate um, choice in relation to the subject of the memorial. Uh, and we also felt that um, it made references to the um, original tribes which uh, lived in the area. And uh, we really commended the project for the subject it took on, which um, is a sort of, it felt like a very deeply felt and very important subject. Um, so we, we were actually really impressed. Um, and um, perhaps the only slight problem we felt was that the architecture itself wasn't as developed maybe as some of the uh, inverted commas architecture entries. And so, but we thought the relationship to the site uh, and the poetry of the project in relation to the site uh, made it like a wonderful landscape entry. And um, we were delighted to uh, decide to give it an award. Mm -hmm. So congratulations and 
thank you. Great, congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're gonna move, yeah, applause, applause. In, in a room, we, there would be a lot of applause and screaming. Uh, thank you so much. So we're gonna go now to our next set of projects and I will introduce our esteemed jurors. Um, uh, Andres Jaque, who is Associate Professor of Professional Practice at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture. Carlos Jimenez, who is a Professor of Architecture at Rice University. And Phoebe Lickwar, who is the Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, Phoebe is here to present the award. So Phoebe, the floor is yours if you want to say a few things before we begin and then we'll walk into the projects. Thank you, Robert. Um, yes, uh, I think a, a theme is maybe building here, um, which I won't divulge immediately, but um, we had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful time reviewing these projects also. Um, and uh, Andreas was actually in China and I think it was 4 a.m. his time. Uh, when, when we met, which you know, neither Carlos nor I knew until near the end of our meeting, and um, and he, he looked really tired. Um, but it, you know, we had we had a long meeting um, and and really enjoyed looking at the work. Um, I think some of the themes that uh, that stood out to us were. Um, as, as has been kind of mentioned, this relationship between landscape architecture and architecture, um, that uh, many of the projects that we felt were the most successful actually um, were, were both, um, you know, showed ar ar architectural and landscape architectural design synthesized. Um, also a, a real attention to the specifics of place the uniqueness of uh, the uniqueness of climate and um, and uh, cultural traditions. Um, so those were some of the the major themes. And um, yeah, I think we can we can move to the first. So we we decided to award um, uh, honorable mention in both categories um, because we felt the projects were, were really worthy. And uh, for the unbuilt architecture, um, the Arroyo Del Oso Elementary School um, by John Anderson Architecture. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Robert. Uh, so the jury noted that um, the civic nature of schools is often neglected. And uh, we really valued that in this project. Um, we commended the intention to create a stage for social interaction and performance for the local community um, in, in a community where it felt like that was actually um, very much needed. Um, you can keep going through the, through the slides. So here you see um, the exterior space and there was a kind of um, reference to uh, artisanal tradition of jewelry making um, that inspired the creation of the facade. But I think much more than that, we were really impressed by the space making, um, the, the qualities of the spaces of the architecture and also the exterior spaces. Um, keep going. Uh, so, you know, here you see these kind of wonderfully crafted and generous volumetric interior spaces. Um, and then to the next slide. Um, and then also attention to the design of outdoor and landscape spaces as integral aspects of the project. Um, so really wonderful work and, and congratulations. So the winner of the Unbuilt Architecture category is the Agave Sanctuary um, by Kayvon Harding. Um, and uh, the, the opening slide um, shows the, this, this beautiful project which considers architecture as a part of a larger ecosystem. 
Um, and uh, the project um, which celebrates the agave um, as a plant and also as a, um, an agricultural product um, is wonderfully sensitive, sensitive to the ecological and cultural considerations um, and the unique qualities of desert climate. Um, so the next slide. Um, we appreciated the clarity of this design um, and the, the restraint, um, as well as uh, the suitability of materials. Um, and I think if you go to the next slide, uh, we'll see, yes, the, the theatrical aspects of witnessing and experiencing plants in the desert. Mm. Um, and the next slide. Um, so I think we were also really impressed with the development of an architectural language that responded to, to climate, but also to broader landscape systems, um, such as water. Um, and, uh, and the movement of uh, and use of plants, um, while also choreographing experiences that honor uh, the site context and uh, this agricultural tradition. Is there one more? Or I think that's one? the last one. Final. Okay, so yeah, one beautiful work. Um, congratulations. So now we go to the Unbuilt Landscape Architecture Award. So we also awarded an honorable mention to the Eco2 Venture, um, Kartika Rakhmawati. Um, and this project um, is uh, beautifully represented, um, stunning drawings um, and very imaginative. Um, and I think in contrast to many of the other um, entries represents a really bold architectural proposal at the scale of landscape systems, um, which are strategized for critical remediation and repair. Um, so even though, um, if you go to the next slide, um, the project, oh, I see in the chat, um, it was a team project um, done by Diana Duran um, and let me pull up that other name uh, and Tanya Neveras um, as well. So let's get the attribution correct. Thank you for that. Um, very important. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is, um, you know, despite the fact that this is a, a, a much larger scale and ambitious project, it still seemed in keeping with the, with the context um, of the place. Um, and, uh, you know, various strategies, um, knitting together ecological restoration, um, and then the next slide, um, also uh, progressive agricultural practices on, on a very large scale. We have one more image. One more. So, yeah, you can go to. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and the winner of Unbuilt Landscape Architecture is uh, Asequias Building Social Resilience in Española uh, by Rafael Montoya. Uh, the jury felt that this project was very carefully researched and, um, and really of the place capitalizing on traditions of land management to strengthen community um, and recovering traditional practices rather than erasing them uh, to address very real challenges um, in the, the town of Española um, in a way that was both inspiring and also practical. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, this shows us the, the overall context um, which is a, a system of, of trails overlaid across the, the system of acequias. And the next. Um, carefully crafted uh, sections, which um, really show the relationships of, um, of the community, um, the orchard, and the acequia system. <clears throat> 
Next slide. Um, and we also felt that the work showed a restraint um, that was admirable, uh, building on, on what, what was present in the site. Um, and you know, not, not only the, the kind of tradition of, of the acequias, but, um, but also actual um, aspects of the site um, that were visible in existing imagery. Um, next slide. Oh, and you know what? This oh. image belonged to the last project. There it is. Yeah. Can you go just go back to the last one? Um, yeah. So uh, I guess my final comment would be um, we really valued how deeply embedded in cultural tradition this project was. Um, and part of that was its resource efficiency. Um, so imagination can come um, in a kind of bold way, but it can also come in a, in a clever way. Um, which is uh, resourceful um, and, um, and synthesizing as well. So congratulations, um, wonderful work um, to all the winners and uh, thank you for the opportunity. So we now go to our uh, final uh, jury uh, and that is for the um, Contemporary Architecture in the Southwest Award. Um, our jurors are Marlon Blackwell, Professor of Architecture at the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, the University of Arkansas, Elaine Molinar of Snoeta, and Tysa Wei, Resident Program Director of Garden and Landscape Studies at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, DC. Great. So Elaine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I... Uh... This was, uh, um, this was uh, really enjoyable. We were really enjoyed uh, reviewing the entries. I think when we all met for the first time, I think we all had a lot of uh, similar viewpoints about the, the project. So that, that was a, a good place to start and to have our, our discussions. Um, With a few disagreements. With a few, yeah. <laughs> but they were fun. They were fun disagreements. Uh, and do you want to say a quick comment about the emerging practice? Oh, sure. I thought uh, I wasn't sure if you were going to start hitting slides or not. Um, there were very, very few entries in this category, and I think the the jury felt that we just we were not able to select a winner in this category. But we really would like to encourage emerging practices to uh, submit for this um, category uh, in the future. Great. Thank you. So should we start with our um, honorable mention? Yes, let's, let's do that. The honorable mention goes to the Montessori of the Rio Grande Charter School, G. Donald Dudley Architect Limited, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, let's see. We uh, were very impressed with this project. We felt the work built on the um, eclectic qualities of local structures in a, in a really nice way. There were very good examples that were put together in the submission. Um, it was a successful completion of a master plan done by the same architect some years prior. Uh, and I, I think it, we felt it was clear that all of the design strategy, the strategies prioritized the student experience and that it, it created a, a, an enriching quality of life at school. And there were some really nice touches like uh, the outdoor um, the outdoor uh, connections between classrooms. Uh, in, in none of my K through 12 schools had outdoor indoor corridors. So <laughs> this uh, this really rang true for me. It's, it's to get outside and feel the climate, um, even in extreme conditions. And and we we appreciated the intimate connection between the indoors and outdoors. And uh, the rainwater collection system was was a, a really nice not only practical, but also delightful and provided some of those educational moments for the students. Um, I think, I guess you can, yeah, you can and kind of see the, the color choices and, and the materials, they were all very tactile and uh, I think offered a good, good experience for, for the young kids in school. Um, let's see, next, next, yeah. You see the, uh, and also just the, the use of, um, 
indigenous vegetation, local vegetation was quite nice. Um, is this the last one? Yeah, this was that's the last one. Yeah, that's the last one. Okay. The also a, a component of this award was was the EDI proposal. Um, this we were very uh, very taken with. It 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 is a, a hands on involvement with a mission driven school across the street from where the firm is located, and it, it, in our in our opinion, it kind of felt uh, it firmed up up an already standing commitment. Um, that the firm already has. So it, it building on and deepening an existing relationship, we we felt confident that even without an award that that these uh, this engagement is ongoing and would continue um, uh, uh, rather than just uh, something that was uh, uh, you know freshly constructed. Um, so I, we we uh, felt that was a very worthy proposal. I don't know, uh, Thaisa, if you have any added comments. I, I would just add again, we were very impressed by the ongoing commitment to the school um, that they talk about, the charter school in downtown Albuquerque. And I just want to say again, we talked about how this school program, the use of architecture and landscape provided all sorts of differently scaled spaces for kids, which we know are so important for kids to be able to gather in by themselves, gather in small groups, gather in bigger groups and really beautifully done in that way. And I think it's reflected in their DEI project, that um, commitment to different scales of communities and real, real live engagement. So real kudos to this group. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. Great. I am going to the next one. I'm looking for my cursor. There we go. <laughs> so now we have the, the winner. And the winner is... <laughs> Rip open the envelope, Casa Caldera by Dust Architects, Phoenix, Arizona. Congratulations. Um, let's see, we go next. Perhaps we can get right into it. Uh, we appreciated this in a number for a number of reasons in a number of ways. Uh, the the sort of the use of age old planning techniques in this case the zaguan or dog trot as it's known in other parts of the, of the country to create energy efficiency without reliance on high technology. Um, so which and this house is, is uh, off grid has off grid status. So um, I think it's it's good proof that that uh, you know. People, people here in generations past have always known how to deal with climate. Uh, at some point in history, we forgot or disregarded. Uh, and so it's nice to see these uh, old tried and true methods come back and create a, a really rather wonderful space and, and uh, with cross ventilation, uh, achieving that energy efficiency and also creating just that picture frame view out into the landscape in uh, either direction. We thought that was really nice. Um, next, uh, it's this house is small, um, which I believe is also an asset. It, it it sits well in the landscape. It's very deferential to its surroundings. Uh, it the the color uh, palette, the materials are, are choices very restrained, uh, very limited use of materials, simple form. Um, it it just has a, it just sits really well. It has. Uh, not only modesty, but I would say boldness and clarity. Uh, and we just, we just, the jury felt it had a very authentic quality and we, we really appreciated the low impact that this has on the environment. It got a lot of mileage out of very, very little. Mm. And I, I think this is what uh, really sort of put it over, over the edge as a, a clear winner in our minds. Um, the, um, are there any more images, Robert? Or one more. Yeah, there's that beautiful view off into the sunset or sunrise. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but uh, incredibly dramatic, peaceful. Um, the yeah, and next maybe yes, uh, the EDI proposal um, for this entry we also felt was pretty solid. It's it's a, a little less active or like uh, active um, than the previous one, although it has tremendous merit um, because as, as we know, funds for exams, licensure, uh, memberships into AIA and, and NOMA, those can be prohibitive for many young practitioners. So uh, we felt that it, it is um, 
it, it was very important and, and worthy to use the prize money in this way to help further the career of, of developing professionals outside of the office, you know, because that's kind of what engagement in our professional communities um, uh, means, you know, and, and I think uh, just increasing the diversity in those organizations is really important. And we can't do that if, if people can't uh, afford membership. Lisa, do you, do you have yeah, any? Yeah, I just would build again on the EDI. One of the things that, that we really liked about this is obviously a firm that's already been paying attention to these issues a bit, just in who they have in their firm and to then invest. We know so often it's one thing to hire a diverse staff, it's another thing to support and steward them. So um, again, kudos, kudos to that um, work. And we hope that each of those individuals might go out then and, and also do work in their own communities, which I suspect will, will follow pretty easily. And again, I just wanted to say on this one, um, looking at it from a landscape architecture point of view, you know, a, a house like that could so easily look more plop and drop in the middle of a landscape and it would still be a lovely house. But I think the way this one was cited, um, if you look here, actually, if we can go back to images, just the placement, um, now one more image back. Yeah, the placement in the landscape was, I think, really beautifully and elegantly done um, so well that you almost don't really notice how well that's done. Um, so just, again, kudos on this one on the materiality, the colors, but also very much the sighting um, and special orientation of each piece. And that sunset, sunrise, you're right, I don't know what, what it is, but the fact that it faces that, clearly really thoughtfulness to its sighting. So kudos to this project. Great. Well, thank you, um, everyone. Thank you to our jurors. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now, uh, but thank you so much to our jurors and congratulations to all of the winners. They, they're finding out about this at this very moment. So uh, great job, uh, great projects. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the, um, the participation across uh, all of the states and the, um, the uh, interest of, of all of the students. So we're gonna open it up now uh, for some questions and answers if you have any questions of the jurors. Uh, and uh, if there are any other thoughts about the awards program, uh, and also if any of the winners uh, want to uh, jump in and, and, and share their thoughts. Don't be shy. Friday night. Friday night. Uh, Jen, uh, Jen has her hand up. I um, was wondering when you guys included the EDI statement requirement. That's something we did this year, and it was something that we we were thinking about. Um, um, how do these firms use their ten thousand uh, dollars? That's that's the, the very few uh, architecture competitions give out large sums of money like that, and we wanted to see also if we could bring the competitions. A mission closer to all of the good work that the Thornburg Foundation has been doing all these years. Um, and so we really wanted to encourage uh, that kind of thinking and to uh, also, you know, a nod to the Thornburg for, for both uh, supporting uh, explorations in contemporary architecture, but also uh, giving something back. So it was a brand new uh, uh, um, addition this year. And, and I would just add as a jury member, it was so exciting to read those, um, not just for the winners that had strong ones and, and the honorable mention, but all of them to, to see firms thinking about that and how they would use it was really inspiring. We are in good hands. Yeah, and, and also uh, more and more RFPs are specifically asking, you know, what, what how does your firm address these issues, so um, mm -hmm. well placed in the award. Yeah, I mean, we, we started to see this kind of social responsibility, I think back when the AIA uh, started uh, excluding uh, firms 
from winning awards if they were not paying their interns. So slowly okay. we've started to see uh, this responsibility uh, enter into the awards world, which I think is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Someone had their hand up. Oh, Alan, are you, did you wanna say something? Oh, I think you just had some questions in the- uh, Oh, I'm sorry if I'm not able, uh, who, oh, Trevor Orgill. Uh, wanted to say something. Trevor? Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Trevor Orgill. I submitted the Opera Hall. I just want to say thank you to everyone that was a part of the jury and everyone here. It was originally done as a competition to design an opera hall along the ocean. And it was something that I just kind of, it was really a part of learning. And it exposed me to all these new things and this new interest in like parametric design and because it was such a large scale project, I had lots of challenges along the way, but I really feel like I've grown from this project. So I wanna thank you all again. Thank you so much, Trevor, wanderful work. Um, I also wanna just mention that Dust Architects is comprised of Cade Hayes and Jesus Robles, and they've been doing wonderful work. So we're so honored that we got to uh, celebrate their work here today. Um, Kartika. Raj Mawadi. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Kartika. So I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone, especially for the jury. Um, and of course, Jeff Hanna Award uh, Committee. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the recognition. Uh, and I also really enjoy watching the presentation from Craig and Elaine. And I've been uh, following Snow Heta and I admire the company very much how uh, you guys, you know, make connection between architecture and landscape architecture is, is really inspiring. So um, the projects that I submit, uh, Rio Eco 2 Venture was originally, uh, is the winner of the Rio Reimagine competition back in 2018. Uh, it was held by AIA Phoenix Metro and ULI Arizona. And I myself is an urban designer working at uh, Brightview Design Group, uh, urban designers slash landscape architects. And uh, last week I was just actually speaking on uh, landscape architecture bus, um, lab bus in Cornell University about re, re like uh, sorry, re, re, I'm <laughs> less, less word. Um, it's the uh, Regenerative ecological urbanism focusing on uh, southwestern uh, United States. So it's uh, using that principle to mitigate the impact of climate change. And I use this project, a real eco to venture, as, as the uh, case study uh, for that regenerative ecological urbanism in desert region. So in, the, uh, in that um, submittal, I actually show the history of the agriculture back in Hohokam uh, tribe period, 300 BC. And then we studied the uh, Rio Salado uh, restoration in uh, Phoenix Metro. And from there, then we focus on the site and, you know, it is a campus uh, development proposal as a research center of agriculture, uh, transformational agriculture using the indoor a vertical system of uh, agriculture to tackle the climate change. So yeah, just want to say thank you again uh, for the honorable mention, which is uh, very precious uh, for my team. So yeah. Congratulations, Kartika. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see another hand, Rafael Montoya. Hi. Um, yeah, I was the uh, winner for the unbuilt landscape architecture submission and uh, landscape architecture submission. And I just wanted to say thank you, of course, to the University of New Mexico School of Architecture and Planning, uh, the Thornburg Foundation, my peers uh, and my peers in, in design, as well as my mentors in design. and. Uh, also a big thank you to my hometown of Española because Española continues to inspire me in my design work as well. So just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, congratulations, Rafael. 
Hi, um, this is Kevin Harding. Um, so my team won the unbuilt category. My other team members are um, Diana Duran and Tanya Nevarez. Um, so I don't think they're online now, so I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of the whole team to UNM School of Architecture and the Thornburg Foundation. Um, all three of us are graduates of the UNM um, architecture program. Um, and so we're really excited to, to have the recognition and thank you again. Oh, I, I also want to say thanks to um, Francisco Uvina, who spent a lot of his free time giving us <laughs> free um, design um, advice as we were going through the, the design process. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kayvon. I think we have uh, any other questions? Janet, did you want to ask your question? Janet Abrams. I'm not going to turn my video on, though. <laughs> um, I, um, it's Friday I, night. <laughs> well. Are you there? Oh, Janet, you muted yourself. I must have leaned on my keyboard. I wanted to ask the jury members for, who are present today to recapitulate and maybe make suggestions as to how the um, Jeff Hanna Award Committee can reach out more effectively and bring in a bigger pool. Particularly, I remember you saying that there were very few entries from Colorado this year. <laughs> I just wanted to hear your, your practical ideas for how to get the message out because this first um, expanded edition of the Hanna Awards is very, very exciting, but it could be um, an even more intensive project for the jury if you had more entries to look at. So what do you think? You know, on that, Robert, I don't have an answer to that, but um, I know for our emerging firms, we did not get enough um, submissions and I'd love to think about ways. It, it, submitting to a, a, a competition like this seems like such a fantastic opportunity for a firm to think about what kind of work they're doing and for a young firm to set a, an agenda for themselves and put that agenda out and share it and celebrate their own work. It seems like a great opportunity. And I know there are young designers out there starting their own firms and so many of them doing such critically important work. Um, so I'd love to be able to think not just how to broaden ge geographically, but how to get some of these great young firms um, to put themselves forward. And, and I suspect in trying to get work, it feels like this is not as important and you should be going after projects and working on the projects you have. But I think this is a fantastic way to get um, your agenda out there. I don't know if there are others on this call that are in new firms or close enough to new firms to remember when you were a new and emerging firm and whether you have thoughts on how we could encourage people to take the time. Well, we had an emerging firm that was uh, faxing across the world uh, doing competitions, Elaine and Craig. <laughs> so I, I, that was yeah. what was so perfect about the lecture today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Get, getting the word out. There are a number. Obviously, there are a number of ways get, of getting the word out. And you, Robert, you probably have, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts around around that. But you know, sometimes it's just to call up a firm that you might know about and say, "Hey, you should apply for this." Mm -hmm. You know, um, just that little bit of encouragement can can often just uh, spur someone on to do that. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, any other uh, question? When maybe one more to close with? Um, it's Katia uh, again. I, I do think I do think that the student award category should be able to include students who have graduated within a year or so, so that their mm -hmm. master projects can be submitted, their thesis, their master projects, That's in the future. Just something to consider. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And one thing we did this year uh, that's different from previous years is we eliminated the student fee so students don't have to pay. But I, I, I think that's a great idea to expand it. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Well, with that, um, I will uh, thank everyone. Uh, thank you first and foremost to Garrett Thornburg for having the vision uh, to uh, remember a close friend, uh, an architect who transformed his life, has transformed our city of Santa Fe. Uh, and thank you to the Thornburg Foundation, uh, Leslie Garcia and Alan Oliver. You've been a pleasure to work with. Uh, this has been a great, great first year for me here. Uh, and thank you to Anthony Fetis uh, for helping us to uh, actually make this happen uh, for uh, a virtual year. Uh, that was uh, a lot of trickery there. Uh, Lori Roach, our development officer who helped us to uh, get everything together from the very beginning and uh, Liz Castillo. And thank you so much to our jurors uh, for coming in with so much enthusiasm uh, and helping us to really uh, meditate on this question of what we mean by the Southwest and now what we mean by the Four Corners. Uh, very exciting. So very exciting to see how this will move forward. Uh, congratulations to all the winners and I hope you go out and celebrate and make it a great Friday night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.